So yeah, it's a nice uh, Friday morning here and I've got my cup of coffee. It's a little earlier than I normally like to do a talk, but there you go. So as uh, Francesco was saying, I spent, um, I spent a large part of my life uh, building operating systems for devices. I just didn't think of them as devices at the time. They were consoles. And eventually when you build enough of them, you realize that game consoles are big, fat, hot, plugged in IoT style devices. They manage like a they manage like a device. They have attacks like a device. They don't have the same patterns as PCs. And after I left that world, I sat down and I'm like, you know, there were some really hard lessons that we learned along the way, and it'd be really interesting to see how you could boil those down into something really small and really focused and aimed at modern uh, aimed at modern problems. And that began a, began a journey for me of uh, exploring other pieces of tech. I eventually found Erlang and Elixir and the Beam and fell in love with it. I found a thing called SEL4, which we'll talk about and fell in love with that and really began to ask, if you were gonna go back to first principles and say, what should an OS be on modern hardware and modern techniques? Um, and then go through that exercise. It's really interesting to see what comes out of it. So I'm gonna talk about um, why this is necessary, why it's necessary to go back and question some of our fundamental understandings of what is an OS. I'm gonna talk about isolation and what is it. And you know, it's a thing we already know and it's a thing we already do, but can we take it further than we've gone before is kind of the question. And then what are we gonna do about it? So let's, uh, let's get this going. So today we're gonna to talk about trust but isolate. And I really do think that uh, this is the future of software. Um, isolation, as I said, is something that we already do. The programmers are already used to it. We've got separation of concerns. We put things in the modules, but it really needs to run up and down the stack and we can go further with it. So let's talk about why. Um, the world is changing in so many ways right now, it's, it's hard to keep track of it. We've got big existential crises, we've got smaller things that are affecting our daily lives. All we know is that we are at the cusp of a major change. We don't know exactly what direction it's going, but computers are part of everything that we're doing and they are playing a massive role in how our lives unfold. So obviously there's external factors that are affecting us and like the big ones, the big obvious ones are climate change and pandemics that may be running around the world. Uh, climate change is really interesting. It's something that's happening. It's something that we have to do something about, but you know, as we're trying to figure out our solutions, what we know is that we have to get more organized on how we do energy and how we organize our infrastructures. And that cr creates problems that we haven't really had to stress before in computing. Um, Industry 4.0 is effectively the merging of cyber and physical realms. So things that we were used to having humans do, now people have effectively robots doing. And it creates a situation where um, you may gain performance efficiencies, but you add risk in terms of failures, in terms of attack surfaces. And we have to have a new approach as to how we think about what is industry and how does it operate. And um, I, I like this picture. I, it, it is a manufacturing line. It's just, I don't know what drink it's making. Okay, a smart infrastructure. I alluded to this in the climate change one. This is, I probably spend more, too much of my time thinking about this one. As you look at the electrical grid, and if you think about water consumption and natural gas and all these things, they are going through massive changes right now. Our substations are being, they've already got computers in them, but they need to be linked and they need to be upgraded in terms of data coming in and out, predictive maintenance, all this, and a whole lot of stuff that is on the verge of happening. This also creates a huge attack surface, both for ransomware, for uh, malicious intent. And the various power companies I've talked to are extremely aware of the need to upgrade, upgrade these subsystems. And frankly, this is the kind of thing we don't think about all the time, but we all depend on it in our daily lives. So it makes me think, are we applying PC and software techniques from the 90s and from the early 2000s, are we applying them to these new situations where maybe we need something slightly different? And then finally, um, smart everything, 
I mean, often called IoT. I, I personally hate that name, but you see that um, you see that brains are putting in being put in devices all over the place. Um, these things have maybe smaller effects on our daily lives than the infrastructural changes, but they still have an effect. Um, you know, you need to know that your kitchen appliances are going to work when you want them to work. If it's time to make dinner and you can't use the thing because it's taking a 10 minute upgrade, that's a problem. So the question then is, if you're building these things, if you're managing them, if you're deploying them, if you're trying to gain insights about them, if you're trying to route power to the right places, and not talked about enough, if you're taking dependencies as you're building these things, can you do all that with confidence? And that to me is the big question. Um, how do we take software systems that were built for PCs where the assumption was a human is sitting there and can do something about an error and transform it into something where it can be deployed, it's in the field and on an event of an error may require a truck roll. So to me, the key to it is isolation and we'll dig into this, but isolation, taking the various pieces, putting them in separate containers, um, isolating them away from each other so that when an attack happens, it can't migrate to the next component or when a failure happens, you know how to recover. It creates resilience. Resilience is the combination of um, ability to recover from errors and ability to withstand attacks. And that leads to having confidence. So effectively, you want to prevent issues. You want to be able to contain them when they happen, and when, and then you have to be able to recover into a back and back into a known good working state. Now I think about that, and it's like, okay, prevent, contain, recover. What does that sound like? Um, to me, uh, it sounds like systems that we're already interested in. Um, I, I forgot I was going to have this slide in here. So examples of isolation. Let's go through some examples first, and then we'll talk about a system that we all already know and love. We've got human isolation, and we're already very familiar with that in the pandemic, right? Why do we wear masks? Why are we going through social isolation? Is to prevent issues from laterally migrating from one host to the next. On devices, like I drove a car, I drove an electric car for six years before I moved to New Zealand and had to get a car with a steering wheel on the other side of the vehicle. Um, that car had two computers in it for two different screens in the, on the dashboard. And the reason there were two computers instead of one computer, which would have cost less, is if an error happened on the mapping system or the music system, it can't affect the way the vehicle's driving. So you use physical isolation to separate those things. We use logical isolation in programming all the time. This would be example, examples would be using modules to do separation of concerns. Um, it would be having separate application processes on an operating system so that one, when one fails, it doesn't take down the rest of the machine. Um, I still remember the days in the early, was it late eighties, early nineties when I'm using really early uh, Mac OSs like Mac OS 4, which I, I still have a personal uh, love for but uh, back in those days before user mode came along, if an app had an error, it would take the machine down. Right, so the reason they did user mode for the reason that they created different modes on the CPUs was to do a separation of those logical pieces to isolate them into containers that when they fail, you can recover from them. And then we have isolation in practice. Things that we do as, especially as programmers in order to uh, not step on each other's toes. In a way, I look at branches in Git as a perfect example of isolation of practice, right? I'm gonna go work in my branch, you go work in your branch. Uh, we'll do a merge eventually, but we've separated and we've isolated the work that we're doing so that we can get it working first before we go and try to do a merge. All right, now the piece that we know and love. We're here at a Beam conference. Um, I'm assuming with this slide that everybody is at least a little bit familiar with how the, what the Beam is and how it works. In the picture that we're looking at, this is a piece of a supervision tree. Each of the bubbles is a process running on the beam. Each of these processes has several characteristics. The first one is it creates a container where if there's a failure, it's an obvious container now on what to restart and how to get back into a known good working state. The things on the right side are more contained. The things on the left side restart everything to the right of them. 
So if you look like one in from the left, you got um, dot 1482.0. That's an anonymous process. It doesn't have a name. That's its process ID number. If it fails, everything to the right of it is restarted versus way on the right-hand side, if 1556 were to crash, it only needs to be restarted. What, what Joe Armstrong and, and Robert Verding and what those guys did when they created the Beam was they created a system that naturally caused the programmers to do fault isolation as you do your programming. Um, actually, when I was learning Elixir, it took me a while to wrap my head around this. And I was building Scenic and I built this, built this scene where I had this button called crash and you hit crash on it and it would restart a bunch of stuff. And then you realize, oh my gosh, the supervision tree is really about limiting the splash damage of a crash, right? Because you could actually visual, visually see only the minimum amount of stuff would actually get restarted and you'd still maintain state and the rest of it. So that was like my first really big epiphany about something we can learn from the beam is you have dependencies, you have fault isolation along a supervision tree, and that's really powerful. The second thing it did was it isolated garbage collectors on these process boundaries. Each of these processes has its own little heap. And effectively, this means that um, through, through the whole, um, th through the fact that you can't directly manipulate the data behind the terms, the garbage collection gets very simple. Each of these processes is effectively its own little garbage collector. A lot of processes are short-lived. The garbage collector never even gets invoked. You create a process, you do some work in it, it goes away, you just destroy the heap and keep going. It has effectively isolated the memory usage of these processes into different term zones, into different garbage collection zones. The next piece it did was it isolated concurrency. Each of these processes is built in a way where it can be run separately from all the others. They can all be contending for CPU resources at the same time, and the beam makes sense of it all through the mailboxing and messaging systems. But effectively, parallel programming becomes tremendously easier because these processes are effectively isolated in time. And that is related to the critical section point where effectively now critical sections are isolated into the beam itself and that's just not something you have to worry about in your, in your Erlang or Elixir code. Finally, um, if you have to write dangerous code, and dangerous meaning um, anything that's not supervised by Erlang, uh, this could be like in Scenic, it's the thing that does the rendering to the screen, or it, has, or it could be really fast mathematics. You can isolate those into ports, and those are effectively different processes. And the, if that port were to crash, it doesn't take the beam down, it uh, is able to restart it and keep it going. The exception to this, of course, is NIFs, uh, native inline functions. If you know what those are, um, sometimes you really need fast code written in C. Like for mathematics in particular, uh, I do a lot of matrix common, matrix uh, multiplications, uh, cross products, that kind of thing, especially in scenic. And you have to do that very, very quickly. So those are written as a NIF, but NIFs are integrated. They're not isolated, and that's a really important point. Things that are integrated tend to be faster. Things that are isolated tend to be safer. So if my NIF were to have an error, I take the beam down, and now you have a problem. All right. So this is one of the themes, and this is one of the realizations that I had as I was going through my exercise of trying to understand what an OS is and what should a modern stack look like, is there's places where you need integration, and there's places where you need isolation. And you have to be very aware of the pros and cons and the dangers of each. So this led me to a concept um, that I'm calling the root of isolation. You know, in, in, in security terms, in security worlds, we talk about certificates. And we talk about certificate chains. And we talk about keys and how keys are related to each other. And we use the phrase root of trust. Your root of trust is that root key that signs all the other keys. And if that key were to become compromised, the whole chain becomes compromised. On a system, whether it's the beam or whether it's the, op the operating system, on a device, you do have a root of isolation. This is the code that enables and creates the isolation sandboxes that you use everywhere else in order to do your containment. So as an example, 
in the Erlang world, with that supervision tree, the beam itself is the root of isolation for that code. You're building modules, you're running processes, and you depend on the beam to do its job correctly to set up those processes and to make sure that they're able to be restarted. In an operating system, it's the kernel. The kernel is your root of isolation. So its job is to go and set up applications and make sure that if one of those were to crash, it doesn't take the entire system down. Its job is to own all the hardware resources, set them up in a way where applications can use them and not be stepping on each other's toes. So the piece here that is maybe not completely obvious is that in both of these cases, the beam and the kernel are not themselves isolated. They are integrated pieces of code. The kernel exists as an entity into itself. And if it were to have an error, that is when you get a blue screen. Um, if there's code that the kernel loads into it that was maybe not written by the kernel engineers, and that code were to have an error, for example, a driver, if a driver were to have an error, that's when you get a fault in the kernel and the machine has to be restarted. Like usually when you're using a Windows machine, if you see a blue screen sitting there, um, it's almost never Windows that had the problem. It's almost always a driver. After all, you're loading millions and millions of lines of code of drivers into a system that is highly integrated. So the question then becomes, what evidence do you have that your root of isolation is correct? Now, this is a really important point. So first big important thing I realized was there is a root of isolation. The second big important thing is once you've identified it, you have to go to pains to understand it's been done correctly. All right, so let's talk about evidence of correctness. In most, solder, in most modern software worlds, we use testing and we go through test processes and we have all these different systems that we use to know that we did our work correctly. They are all probabilistic. I've spent my entire life working through test systems that are probabilistic testing. In other words, hey, stress may have run beating on my piece of software for two weeks on end. Do I know there's no... There's no critical sections that are going to fail. Do I know that there's nothing that's going to happen if the timing is exactly right? No, I don't. You don't. Uh, but you have high probability that it's good. When you go to a kernel, and the kernel is the root of your system, I don't think that's good enough anymore. I need more evidence that it's been done correctly. So the question is, how do you do it? And I, the answer is formal methods. Formal methods or um, in other words, mathematical proofs of the correctness of your code are extremely difficult. They are taught in computer science classes and usually go along the lines of, okay, here's formal methods, here's how you do them. It's way too hard, so you'll never use this again, um, but at least you know it's there. Uh, there is a way to do it. And the way you do it, and this is something that we learned from a team in Australia, which I'll talk about in a bit, um, is first you build an abstract model of your code. What a lot of people try to do is they build their code and then they try to create a proof of that it is correct and it doesn't work. It's way too hard. You have to go the other way around. You build an abstract model of your code, which isn't the actual code. This is the idea of what's in your code written in formal languages. And then you write a C implementation that implements the abstract model. From there, you can write a proof which will prove that your C implementation is a correct implementation of the abstract model. That sounds hand wavy. Uh, the tool that you're interested that you want to use is called Isabel, um, and it has a mathematical proofing language in it. This is a machine runnable proof, and what it does is it takes your abstract model as an input, it takes that C implementation as an input, and they're both data, and you can apply data to a proof, and it will tell you yes or no. This C implementation is a correct implementation of the abstract model, right? Um, that blew my mind and it continues to blow my mind as I continue to really understand what this means. It means that you can't have someone uh, insert, purposefully insert a supply chain attack into the C implementation because it will violate the abstract model and the proof will show that. It means that you cannot have things like a buffer overrun or uh, certain other errors if they're modeled in the abstract model. 
because that C implementation will tell you yes or no. This implementation, the proof will tell you yes or no, this implementation is a correct implementation implementation of the abstract model. All right, that's good. That really was really interesting. Uh, but who cares? Because at some point, someone's going to insert a supply chain attack into my compiler. And then my binary output has got a problem. So uh, the next proof you write is one that takes your C implementation and proves that the binary code is a correct implementation of the C code. Uh, this is really hard. It means you have to disassemble that binary code. It means you have to inspect it. You have to prove that the logic in it is done correctly. If you get that proof right, you can prove yes or no, there were no supply chain errors in the compiler. You can prove that the compiler did not make mistakes and mistranslate what you intended from the C implementation. It's expensive. You have to do one of these for every architecture you're targeting. Uh, so if you want to do an ARM chip, you have to have a separate proof for the ARM chip versus a RISC-V chip. OK, but now how do we know that the abstract model had the right things in it? Uh, well, things that we care about are confidentiality, integrity, availability, and timing channels. So confidentiality, can I prove that one application cannot get data out of a different application? Can I prove that my, that my kernel doesn't have buffer overruns, that it doesn't have the variety of well-known attacks that we worry about? Can I prove for availability, can I prove that one application is unable to cause a different application to quit? Now, the example here is, let's say I have a drone and I've got a mapping application that is communicating over a radio. And as it's flying along, it's getting its next instructions and where it should go. And an attack comes in over the radio and successfully takes down the mapping app. Can you prove that the mapping app is unable to cause the avionics subsystem to quit? You don't, you don't have to change it. All you have to do is get it to stop running. Because if I can cause your avionics to quit, then the drone's going to crash. Then timing channels are hard. Can you do things like, can you prove that one application calling a server can't effectively denial a service attack that server, preventing another application from getting a critical resource? Related, can you prove that, um, can you make statements with proof behind them about other timing channel attacks, whether they're in caches or other things? So it turns out you can, you just have to write more proofs. First, you have to model those things, and then you write a proof showing that, say, confidentiality is modeled correctly in the abstract model. So now you have a chain of proofs going all the way up and down, and you can effectively end up with a piece of binary code where you say, yes, this binary code does not have these integrity issues. This binary code does not have these availability issues. Um, I did not invent any of this. Uh, this, was, this was pioneered by the SEL4 team. Uh, they're in Sydney, Australia, and uh, they've been working on this for years. Uh, the SEL4 Foundation is the current maintainer of this code. They have all these proofs running. The, uh, the proof um, timing channels is in progress. And if you're curious, that would be the MCS proof, the Mixed, crit mi mixed Criticality Services proof. Um, and effectively think of SEL4 as a kernel now. It's roughly 10,000 lines of code. All the proofs to show it was done correctly are in the millions of lines of code. And uh, the little link down at the bottom with the video, that is a link of Gernot Heiser, who is the head of that group, explaining this in better detail than I can because he actually understands the math, whereas I can only talk about it. All right, that blew my mind when I finally wrap my head around all this. So that let me step back and you say, well, what would an operating system on top of this kind of kernel look like? Right, because a kernel is not an operating system. It is just things that enforces rules, especially, especially a kernel like this. In order to get that proof to work, you have to make it as small and tight as you can. So drivers get kicked out. Um, higher level logic gets kicked out. It, it is now something called capabilities, which is effectively policies, a scheduler, and nothing else. But you know that they are correct. So how would you build an OS on top of it? Well, you start with hardware, and then you add a kernel on top of it. And that kernel becomes the logical root of isolation for the entire computer. It must be correct. Any error here will violate 
the integrity of the entire system. On top of that, you build an OS layer. The job of the operating system layer is to effectively program the policies being executed by that kernel. You're telling the kernel, go create a sandbox for an app or uh, go allow this driver to talk to that, uh, go talk to that um, address for a piece of hardware. And then on top of that, you add business logic where you've got applications and drivers. Um, but to really understand it, let's take another look at it. So that first layer is physical. The second layer, the kernel, if it's proven, it needs to be proven because it's integrated. It is an integrated piece of code. It is a quanta of code, <laughs> if you will, right? You don't isolate inside of it. It has to be performant. It has to do its job. It needs to have the highest level of confidence that it is correct. And, and I think the only real long-term answer here is that that kernel needs to be formally proven. On top of that, you have an operating system. Those components are not formally proven, but they are trusted. Because they're not proven, you isolate them away from each other. Here's what this means. Those managers, those have the ability to create the apps above, but you take away from those managers the ability to enable communication or to talk to hardware. You put those in separate boxes and those are isolated from each other. And that is to prevent attacks from traveling horizontally across those OS layers. Um, if an error were to happen in a driver, let's say a driver were to crash, and, you know, you see a blue screen or something, you don't have to anymore because those drivers are isolated, they can be restarted. It doesn't affect the managers or the communication of the rest of the system. That piece can be restarted. And then up at the top, you have the applications, which you treat as untrusted and highly isolated from each other. And this allows app A to have a dependency on app C and to do it with confidence because even if app C, which you didn't write, has an error in it or has a supply chain attack in it, it can't break out of its sandbox. And you know it can't break out because that kernel, which is doing the enforcement, has been formally proven. So another view of the same thing. Take the business logic and the operating system layer, and let's treat those as, this is just code. Sitting behind it is the formally proven kernel, and sitting behind that is the hardware. You know, you'll notice that, there's, that they line up. And effectively, what the OS is doing is programming policies into the formally proven kernel. Each of these applications is running directly on the kernel. And that would look something like this. Driver A has a policy allowing it to use that region of memory in hardware. It does not have a policy allowing it to use the region of memory um, reserved for the other applications or a driver. It cannot do it. It is unable to reprogram the MMU. It does not have permissions to see that other memory. Um, it looks very organized. Do you guys remember this sort of view of the world when you had to do disk de de defragmentation and you end up with files that are split into pieces all over the place? We don't worry about that anymore because SSDs are fast enough that it just doesn't matter for performance purposes. But effectively, this is what it looks like in the hardware of monolithic kernel systems, monolithic kernels. Um, things where lots of the components are in the kernel, where drivers are in the kernel. Um, you end up splitting up that hardware across lots of pages that are just sort of mixed and matched. And it doesn't matter for performance reasons, but it does get confusing and it does make it difficult to have formal proofs that apps are only able to touch the pieces that they can. It gets much harder when we're talking about drivers, which are living in the kernels. All right. So effectively, think of the new of the job as the operator of the operating system now as the orchestrator of policies that a formally proven kernel sets up and executes. Or rather, the OS sets up the policies, the formally proven kernel executes the policies. And in this way, you end up with a highly organized set of hardware, a highly organized set of applications. And that gives you confidence that the dependency you've taken isn't going to, isn't going to take you down. It gives you confidence that I can restart an app or I can restart a driver and I can just wipe that piece of memory and reset it. It gives me confidence that I can update an application leaving all the others running. Like um, we have this, uh, we have this smart mixer in the kitchen and it's got recipes and it's, it's actually really, really cool. 
And uh, sometimes you go to cook dinner and it says, hey, I'm going to take an update. OK. And if you make a mistake and you hit that OK button, you've just delayed dinner by 20 minutes. Right. And it drives me crazy. And I don't know if it's because the underlying code is being changed or if it's because the recipe app is being changed. It doesn't matter. I want a world where I can update that recipe app and the rest of it is still running. Right. There's a lesson here from Erlang. Why does re why does restarting or updating a single application on a device require restarting the entire device? When what Erlang teaches me is that if I do my isolation correctly, I can restart and update one app on a device and leave everything else running and take zero downtime on it. That's the goal. All right, I'm going to give one more view of the same thing because it's confusing enough. And I get confused on it enough that I want to help emphasize it one more time. So from here on up, from the kernel's point of view, I'm effectively, I've effectively got device isolation. From this layer up, I effectively have application isolation. Then within an application, you can set up environments like the beam where now I've got logical isolation within an app. I have fault zones, I have all the good things that we get from Erlang. So you effectively have trees of isolation and types of isolation, but they all depend on that logical root down in the kernel. And if you get this right, you can have a system that is very fault tolerant, very easy to update, um, and very reliable. Trust but isolate. All right, I'll wrap up. Um, so the, the what work we've been doing is effectively build that operating system. Uh, so it's the Crichton operating system trying to really embody this trust but isolate philosophy. Definitely going hard on working with SEL4 and then embracing those formal proofs so that there's evidence that there's correctness at the bottom. Um, our goal is definitely to allow devices to be built and deployed with confidence. Um, the bottom line, it's time for the beam on devices. There's nothing I've said here that, that doesn't say, I, how to put it, I love nerves and nerves is how you get started on all of this now. And I believe they live side by side. And between these two operating systems, I absolutely believe it is time for the beam on devices. Right. As you use the beam and you think about resiliency and recovery and fault tolerance, good gosh, it needs to be on, on the world's devices now. Right. And you've got a system that's ready to go right now, and you've got a system that's coming. They have different properties, and I encourage both. Uh, the current state of the Crichton operating system is we have just finished our very first major milestone, handing it off to a customer. Um, they're doing their work on it, and it's a very exciting time. I would say it's still coming along. There's a lot of work to do in tooling, but those initial customers are busy using it, and I would tell you what it is, but um, they actually can't tell me what it is because the types of people who care about this level of isolation in the beginning are all doing classified stuff. Okay, so I'm going to go, I'm going to turn off the uh, sharing. And I would love to take some questions. So does anyone have any questions? Don't be shy. Hi, Boyd, uh, Sean Kurtz. Um, I, I put one in the Q&A, uh, so I'll just read it to you. Uh, given that, that modern computer architectures are much more like distributed systems, uh, for example, multiple architectures running on the same board that run their own software and communicate over buses, how, how do you contend with the, the fact that a firmware exploit might violate the proofs of the kernel that's running on the CPU? And, and like, can that kernel provide some kind of end-to-end -end, uh, property that, that would protect it? Yeah, great question. So um, let's, okay, so this is kind of, a, this is a really deep question and exactly on the nose. So let's start with, when you've got mixed architectures on a single board, and uh, this could be everything from a discrete GPU, which has running shaders, uh, which uh, in a unified memory architecture should scare everybody because those shaders, there's nothing saying a shader can't output executable code on the CPU, and it's all in the same memory region. And then we've got like TensorFlow chips, and we have AI-specific chips, 
two things have happened at the same time. One is a form of physical isolation where I've got different kinds of logic that are isolated on the different physical devices, but it sits below the kernel. So that becomes a problem. Um, there is an explicit um, assumption that the CPU this kernel is on is done correctly. So let's say a meltdown or a specter bug were to happen, that is in hardware. There's absolutely nothing software can do about that. But what you can do is we can take the next level of the conversation. Um, it's, it's, in other words, I, you see this coming and it's like a year down the road for, in my life. Um, the next level of the conversation is the interface between software, meaning that kernel and hardware and having deeper conversations with the hardware manufacturers to make sure that the right vectors are in place and that uh, you can do things from a security perspective that need to be there. Um, example, uh, one way that you would protect against uh, a GPU uh, spewing uh, executable code into memory is you have to encrypt memory and use different keys for different pages. And then, you know, hey, that GPU, go ahead, have fun. You don't have the keys that are in the registers that are on the CPU. That kind of stuff. That's actually a pretty old technique that's used in different places, but it needs to become more modernized and more and more um, available on inexpensive computers. I think about some of the trust zone works that's going on. That work has largely been done with uh, Linux in mind. But how can we better use those intrinsics in this kind of a kernel in order to boost the overall veracity of the system? So it's a complicated question. Um, and the first part is to just freely admit bugs in hardware uh, sit below the kernel and there's nothing you can do about them in software. The second part is to realize it is a conversation with the hardware people. And the third part is, are there mitigations you can put in place against rogue hardware? Um, and for example, some, a bunch of the modern CPUs have got effectively IO MMUs. So you can program what regions of memory the IO uh, space is allowed to write into in a, in a DMA fashion. And that's an absolutely critical part of the story. Uh, and that depends which CPU you've chosen to put on your device. Okay, thank you, Boyd. And any follow-up questions, Sean, or... Uh... Okay. No, Fabian. we can take it to two can. Okay. Oh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, Fabian, you had a question. Okay, so <clears throat> he... I see that Quinn had, Quinn had a hand up. Yeah. Yeah, um, I noticed on the last slide that you said that you have evidence of correctness for Crichton. Can you speak to a little bit what the difference is? Um, the evidence that I'm leveraging right proof? now, yeah, the, average, the evidence that we're leveraging right now is the proofs of SEL4. Okay, gotcha. Yeah, so it, uh, look, writing proofs is extremely difficult and as it turns mm -hmm. out, extremely expensive. Um, so we're leveraging those proofs first and making sure that we're doing our work in a way that doesn't violate any of the assumptions in the proof. And then uh, in our roadmap, some of the components that live in the OS will end up having proofs on those. Um, but as a small company with limited budgets, I have to I have to pick and choose. Yeah, that, that doesn't sound approachable at this point. <laughs> okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, so Fabian's question was, um, what languages are the SEL4 proofs written in? Uh, yeah, so the, those those proofs are written in a in a language in a tool called Isabel. Um, and it, if you look it up, you'll you'll find it. It's out of uh, a UK and a German university. I'm going to screw it up if I try to say the names. Uh, but Isabel is effectively it's called the Isabel Proof Assistant. Um, it has its own language. You build proofs in that language, and then the proofing tool effectively treats those proofs as computer code, and it will logically, using deductive logic, uh, tell you that yes or no, this piece of data conforms to a shape of a proof. Um, and it is beyond my understanding in mathematics. Right, But the tool you're interested in is Isabel. And my math nerd friends are all over it. They love it. <laughs> Modest as well. So uh, we have, we've got another question from Analito. If you're there, Anna, can you mute yourself? Sorry, I'm cooking at the moment while I'm listening. <laughs> <in>. <laughs> Right. Um, and so uh, my question was about redundancy. That's a very kind of 
uh, standard tactic in critical systems. You, Boyd probably knows, you know, double and triple redundancy is very common in things like satellite and military applications. Do you see that fitting into your model somehow? Um, if you, do you mean, well, look, there's physical redundancy, there's software redundancy. Um, Software redundancy is relatively easy. You can have multiple copies of an application waiting for one to failure, fail and another is coming up. There's nothing saying I can't bring up multiple copies of the beam, put them into a, put them into a, a distributed cluster on one device and have it work that way. Having physical redundancy, it, it becomes a question that is very, it's very device specific, right? Like if I was doing a satellite application, I would have multiple computers that are literally running in parallel and then link those together in a cluster. Um, but I'm not doing satellite, so I have no idea if, if actual satellite people would like that answer. <laughs> um, yeah, so Anna, I think the, um, I, I, the answer to that question is, is very device specific. Um, I do think that redundancy is really, really important, but I, I couldn't tell you uh, which of the pieces I would push on unless we dug into the scenario. Yeah, it was, I was kind of wondering if you'd consider having um, redundancy as a strategy in your, um, in your OS, and because you, you, you were talking about how your operating system really needs to be 100% um, available uh, all the time, which, you know, redundancy is therefore really availability type of right. problems in terms of security. So I was wondering if that kind of is a thought or plays into the equation somehow, but yeah, I let guess the answer is not yet. <laughs> well, let, let me, let me, let me, I think you're right. The answer is not yet. And I'll give you the specific reason why. If we're talking about satellites, just like if you're talking about reactors, one of the big problems is that bits will just flip, right? A gamma ray comes in, it flips a bit in memory and there's nothing you can do about it. So as I've sat down with people who do that for a living, there was a conference here in Wellington, New Zealand, of, just before the pandemic hit. And it was really interesting. I'm sitting in this room with all these people who work at you know, labs in the US where um, they can't tell you what their actual projects are. And this is exactly the kind of stuff they worry about. They worry about gamma rays coming in and flipping bits and hardware and they have highly redundant systems. And from my point of view, at least in the beginning, that becomes a hardware problem. Right. I'm not dealing with systems that have petabytes of memory where you know that some of the some of that memory is just going to flip. I'm not dealing with systems that are up in satellites yet. That will come in time. Uh, but for now, we can talk about systems that aren't in highly radioactive environments. Um, and what I care about then is if there's an error in the OS, if one of those OS layers uh, applications were to fault, I want, I want to be able to detect it and restart the machine really quickly. Hey, may I? Uh, th thank you, Boyd, for pushing the envelope at the OS level. Um, uh, I, I appreciate it. But speaking of time, uh, do you have a timetable for this? I know it's a question that it sounds wonderful. Uh, how long are we looking at? Two years, five years? Do you have any sort of... Oh, uh, yeah. Um, I've, already, I've already been working on it for five years. So about the five years of my life has already gone into this thing. Um, we're at the point now where um, I think sign-off is in a week on the first release that I feel good enough to give the customers. But it is uh, not, I would say it's not done. I would say those early customers have to expect uh, a very close working relationship because you know we know that there's gonna be some issues and we know that we haven't fought through all the scenarios. So it's like, like when you're building a game on a console that hasn't, hasn't shipped yet, you've got most of what you need, but you're also kind of standing on shifting sands. Right, so the next few months to a year is going to be a little bit of that, but I expect devices will be in the real world running this uh, within a year. Okay. Congratulations and, and thank you. Yeah. So Turban Hoffman has a follow-up question on this. Uh, Turban, if you're there, yeah, yeah, there you are. If you're mute, yeah, so. yeah. I am here. I'm Boyd. Uh, what's it, what's it going to cost to get? Oh, what's it going to cost? Um, I don't actually know yet. Um, it's early enough where we're working with a few very close partners, and uh, that is more the approach we're taking for now. Um, I know I know a couple of things I can say for sure. It's not free, um, but the OS itself 
Um, the intention is not to have uh, like a per device cost be a barrier. It's, my interest is more is in the overall services that support it and help maintain it and help update it. Right, and that becomes more of a conversation on how many devices, how complicated devices, that kind of stuff. Um, I want companies to be able to build devices for other customers on a contract sort of basis really easily and really profitably. And yet at the same time, especially in the beginning, as this thing is coming together, I can't handle thousands and thousands of projects all at the same time. So I have to put some barriers up, right? So I would say if you're interested in this, it is a conversation. It's probably not a hobby level thing right now. This is a uh, serious projects that are like going to be deployed in the field and have got specific characteristics, right? So we're talking to some, like some fisheries type people and advanced farming type people and uh, uh, advanced communications type people, right? Who have very specific needs. And then over time, I can, I can relax that stance and, and we'll see where it goes. Okay, Thanks, one, thank you. We have, we have time for one last question. Uh, Pierre Stritzinger, if you're there. Hey, Pierre. So, and I tried I'm, to talk yesterday. Can, you read, can you read the question? I'm, I'm in a noisy place. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, um, how about ARM v9 architecture proofs? Yes. Um, so, the ARM proofs are currently in the domain of the SEL 14. And the current, the most recent version of the ARM chips is something they are actively working on. Some of that is dependent on funding. So uh, there is conversations with the SEL4 foundation on how that gets funded, how, that, how those specific proofs get completed. But the parties that are interested in that are very interested in it. So that work is ongoing and active. And this is the beautiful thing about working with the SEL4 Foundation. SEL4 itself is open source, it's free. You can go play with it right now. It's, um, it's not an OS, so don't expect something that's easy to use, but it is a shared resource with lots of interested parties who are able to put money into it and get those kinds of proofs done because they are not easy. <laughs>